Well, good afternoon, everybody, on this uh, lovely Sabbath. We're getting some moisture out there that we sorely need. Lately, we've seen in the news uh, all the bad news about uh, the COVID, and we our minds can go to prophetical ideas. And maybe it's been a few years since we've really looked at prophecy and uh reviewed what we know. So today what I want to do is uh, review and discover seven points about biblical prophecy. I'm not going to get into any specifics, but I'm going to give an, an outline of what prophecy is used for. Well, God inspired the writers of scripture to record prophecies to reveal not only how God will intervene, but why he will intervene in the affairs of men. Prophecy discloses many details of, of God's great design. It explains actions in human affairs and how they relate to his plan to restore his kingdom to this earth. God inspired much of prophecy to relate to the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Prophecy explains the necessity of both his first and his second coming to be part of God's plan for mankind. The apostles often referred to prophecies Jesus had already fulfilled to prove that he was the Messiah, but they also look and spoke about the coming, his second coming. So point number one I want to get into, and the first important key to understand is biblical prophecy almost always directly relates to the intervention in human affairs by one key player, and that is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Jesus, the Messiah figure, is a central part of prophetical uh, writings. In fact, the point number one to remember is that a major purpose of prophecy is to reveal the mission of Jesus Christ. These are what we may call Masonic themes in prophecy. Almost all Bible prophecy is in some way related to the setting up of the literal rule of Jesus Christ and having authority over the earth. The return of Jesus Christ to establish the kingdom of God will mark the beginning of the end of many life-threatening problems. And the prophets described these in writings and words. They pleaded with the public about these needs. Let's now turn to Luke 24. Luke 24, we're going to start in verse 44. So Luke 24, verse 44. And it says, then he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. He made clear that the scriptures were written about him. Turn ahead one or two pages to Acts 1, Acts 1, and I'll just start in, in verse 1. It says, the, the former account I made, O Theodopolis, and, and all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day he was taken up, and he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after sufferings by many infallible proofs being seen by them during 40 days, 40 days after he died, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Well, that's pretty amazing that he came back in the first place and that he, his message was about the kingdom of God. Another purpose of prophecy is to urge repentance and to offer everyone forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Again, it's about Jesus Christ. Uh, we can turn back to where we were. We are in Luke 24, another scripture there, Luke 24. And this is going to continue that thought. This is a, 
the next couple scriptures, 46 and 47. So then he said to them, thus is it written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. This is a prophetical speech that he's saying that these things are going to happen, that going to rise and this message is going to be preached into the future. The, this focus on bringing all peoples to repentance, it soaks in and permeates the prophecies of the Bible. Jesus himself said, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer. Now, Isaiah, he also had a message for us. In Isaiah 29, verse 13, Isaiah 29, verse 13. And it says, Wherefore, the Lord said, For as much as his people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do to honor me, but they've removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precepts of men. So mankind is telling them how to fear God, and, and they're not listening to God's word himself. He says, therefore, in verse 14, Isaiah 29, verse 14, therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise shall perish, and the understanding of the prudent men will be hid. Prophecy gives us an, also an idea that people have hearts of stone. Ezekiel spoke of this heart of stone. And he said, for, and this is in Ezekiel 36, let me read it to you. Our Ezekiel 36 said, for these people come near me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This becomes an unyielding attitude towards God's instruction. The hard hardness in people's hearts, it turns selfishness and selfishness to greed and envy to hatred. And that brings us closer to the unhappiness and death that the, these, these bad fruits provide us. But you know what? Bible prophecy reveals how God will ultimately correct the problem. He also says in Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit in you. I will take the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will do them. Prophecy explains God's plan to bring the change of heart of otherwise known as repentance and conversion to all people to solve the root problem that mankind suffers with. Point number three, Bible prophecy analyzes the past and provides a vision for the future. So that would be, uh, let's turn to Acts. Back to Acts, the first chapter, there's some good information there. I'm going to read out of the NIV Bible. So the Bible often reveals specific events and sequences of events, but rarely does it reveal the exact time and dates of these things. Now, a lot of times people can go crazy making dates and trying to calculate all these, these numbers. Uh, just for fun, I, I took together a number of prophecies that had dates on it, 1300, 1250, 360, 70, 60, I mean, all kinds of numbers, and I put it all together. And amazingly enough, it didn't help. It didn't help us understand it at all. So we can get crazy about numbers. Now, Acts 1, and we turn to uh, verse 6 and 7. Acts 1, verse 6 and 7. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Well, we're going to be used to proclaim it. We're not going to know what time it's going to come, so don't mark your calendar, but it's coming. The principle reflected here holds true for most prophecy. God seldom reveals specific times of their fulfillment. It is not God's purpose that we know the exact time and fulfillment of these prophecy, but God wants us to recognize the many prophecies that have already been fulfilled as evidence that his word is true and he's accurate and he's reliable. Christ, and we know this one, this is the uh, Matthew 24, when he's talking about the temple coming down and stuff, the disciples ask on an occasion, said, when will these things be? And Jesus listed several trends, rumors of wars and diseases and epidemics and deception and uncontrollable earthquakes and storms. But it, he finally comes down to the bottom line and says, all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. So Jesus did not give them a specific sign that would herald this coming. Rather, he stressed the need to take heed, to pay attention, to be spiritually alert and on guard, that you should not be deceived because only the Father knows the time that he's coming. Yet we can understand important prophecies and prophetic principles that give clear indication that his return is pretty close. Uh, Daniel 12, Daniel 12, and I'm going to read this one from the Revised Standard Version. The prophet Daniel asked an angel to explain certain end-time prophecies that had been revealed to him. What did he say? Verse 6, well, I'll start in verse 5. It says, then I, Daniel, looked, and two others appeared, one standing on his back of the stream and the other the other. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was upstream, how long shall it be until the end of these wonders? The man clothed in linen was upstream, raised his right hand and his left hand towards heaven, and I heard him swear by the one who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a times. And here's where you can really get start getting hung up trying to, to guess dates and everything. But now, bottom line, verse 9, he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are to remain secret and sealed until the time of the end. And he talks about those signs of the end. Well, that's kind of neat. The principles here tell us that we're just not going to know, but we can understand by scriptures talking about the times of the end that it's pretty obvious we are in that point of time number four point number four there is cause and effect in prophecy now mr Beatty started talking about cause and effect as as it relates to covetousness well cause and effect is also in prophecy it is the ability to relate the correlation of sin to bad stuff that happens or doing righteousness and seeing joy fulfilled, for instance. Now in Galatians, let me go back to Galatians. And that is in chapter six, Galatians chapter six. I cheated. I piled up a whole bunch of Bibles with my scriptures already laid out. So Galatians chapter six, verses seven and eight. It says, be not deceived. God is not marked for whatsoever a man soweth that he shall reap. Again, we're, we're talking about cause and effect. What you sow, you reap, cause and effect. Verse seven, be not deceived. God is not marked for Whatsoever a man soweth, he shall reap. For what? For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit 
shall the spirit reap life everlasting. So it gets into the idea, cause and effect, the nature of the physical body versus the spiritual body. Uh, Jeremiah also speaks of this in chapter two of Jeremiah. This is a, a one verser, Jeremiah chapter two, verse 19. And it says, your own wickedness will correct you and your backsliding will reprove you. But what we know is that God sometimes will exercise control over the consequences that happen in our lives and change the outcome. But God does intervene to alter the course of history. Okay, so we're on point number four. Now, punishments, not so nice to talk about. Never liked being sent to the principal's office. I remember in second grade, I got sent to the principal's office because I, after a test, I, I got up and I were not supposed to get up in class. And I said, like, you, March Banks, go to the principal's office. I never went. I hang out by the boys' bathroom and then I just went back but because I was scared of the principal. <laughs> All right. God spoke of the cause and effect principle to Moses when he gave ancient Israel his law. He inspired Moses to warn Israel. And this is in Deuteronomy 8, verse 11 through 20. It's kind of long. I'm going to paraphrase it because it is pretty long. But it says, beware that you forget not the Lord thy God and not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command you this day, lest when you have eaten and are full, you built beautiful houses and dwell in them and you got herds and cars and all kinds of good jewelry and silver and gold that your heart gets lifted up and you forget all about me well that's what the flesh wants to do and this goes with what sandy's talking about the covenants i want all this stuff from me excuse me <coughs> but now we're looking at closing this idea in verse 20. Start 19. And it shall be, if thou do all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods, keep Christmas, keep Easter, all that stuff, and serve them and worship them, I will testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. Cause and effect. You listen to the word of the Lord your God, you're going to be blessed. You do contrary to that, here come your curses. It's terrible. Uh, number five, point number five. Prophecy provides us far more than a simple list of predictions. Prophecy analyzes attitude and behavior, doesn't it? Past, present, and future, and reveals God's perspective and reactions. Uh, we cannot correctly understand biblical prophecy without some knowledge of the background of the period and the era, the history, culture, and uh, a little bit about the prophets who speak the words. So prophetic books such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel are filled with history that includes analysis of conditions existing at the time they were written. They contain instructions, correction, warnings, pleas for change. They present opinions, sometimes vividly explaining potential consequences. An accurate biblical worldview requires an understanding of God's view. Did you get that? If you're going to understand a worldview according to the Bible, you got to have God's point of view on the history and world and what was influencing at the time. Now, one of these books, this one right here. In college, I went to, I went to Cal State Fullerton, and one of the classes was called Comparative Literature. Well, I'm in the church at the time, and I go, well, they got comparative literature of the Bible. And so this was really interesting. It was, uh, we use this Oxford Bible, and it was 
new revised standard version. And it was really interesting because the instructor taught us not only just to read the words, but to know the times and events, to read the footnotes, to get a feeling for what was going on at that point in time in history and culture, and to get a clearer perspective of what is written in the scriptures. We need to recognize that, that God intervenes, intervenes in the affairs of men and to fulfill his purpose. But it's just important that we understand the perspective of God. Now, another thing we, we have in this perspective is that when we're reading biblical prophecy, it's kind of difficult. Sometimes it's easier to, to listen to it on tape and, and just hear it go on and on and on and start hearing it repeat itself and start getting clues. Um, it takes a lot of time to read this stuff. And there's times and there's places and there's names, there's words we can't pronounce very well. But a lot of this is just about taking in massive quantities of scripture and, and repeating it and just letting your head be filled with it. All right, point number six. What is a prophet and what is a prophet sent to do? Second Peter. Second Peter, chapter one, verse nineteen. Right here. I like this this scripture. I actually want to. Yeah, verse nineteen says, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed in Second Peter, verse one, verse nineteen, and we have prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Now listen to this. Knowing first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. So what I have to say about it, what anybody else has to say about it, I mean, that's great, but it's about God's point of view, not our point of view. It's not a private interpretation. It says, for prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Peter describes prophets as holy men of God who were spoke and were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Hebrew word for prophet, Nabi, means one who announces or brings a message from God. That's a lot put into four little letters. The one who announces or brings a message from God. Our English word prophet has essentially the same meaning, one who speaks by divine inspiration as an interpreter or spokesman for God. And it could be whether that's a message of duty, warning, or prediction of future events. So same meaning, speaks by divine inspiration. Uh, Daniel 9 has an interesting one-liner in it, and I'll, I'll read that to you, Daniel 9.6. And this is about the importance of the role of the prophets. Daniel refers to prophets as God's servants. He's talking to God. He's saying, your servants, so God's servants, who spoke in God's name to the kings of the world and to the princes of the world and to our fathers and to all people of the land. They're God's servants. There were messengers whose role went far beyond revealing the future. Some prophets gave instruction and pointed to lessons from history. Some reminded the people of their covenant with God. Some showed kings and nations their sin and proclaimed God's call to repentance. In Samuel, God simply calls a prophet a man of God. God usually reveals his will to prophets through visions and dreams. We've heard the story of Samuel, perhaps, that is a young man. He hears the, the voice, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answers, I hear, Lord. And he goes to uh, the priest and says, no, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. And eventually he answers, yes, my Lord, I hear you. So that's how it was done at that time. Now we have our, our scripture and our Bible. We have our knees and our prayer. We were fortunate to have the Holy Spirit. So 
in these dreams. They saw clear mental images that God wanted them to convey to the people. I think of the crazy images in Ezekiel about the, the wheels and the wheels and the cherubim and the wings and the sounds. I mean, it's, it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. They described in their own words, style, what they saw or heard. I can't imagine what Ezekiel was seeing. But it is the throne of God. And again, we see John had that in Revelation as well. He saw the throne of God. Sometimes God said words to them that they were to repeat. Thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. The prophets consistently assured ancient Israel and Judah that a righteous king would come to restore a kingdom of earth. Again, the, the Masonic theme. That was point number six. Number seven, point number seven, last point. Rewarding the saints. I think I got the Bible here. I've lost track. Revelation 20, verse six. Jesus Christ has promised to reward people who through the ages have faithfully served him. So this is notice of that you're going to be part of the kingdom, basically. It says in Revelation 20, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But what? But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. This thousand years commonly referred to as the millennium thousand year time span when the earth is made well again and the saints the resurrected saints are uh, helping the government helping jesus take care of things uh daniel 7 verse 27 basically foretold the the same thing daniel 7 27 and the kingdoms and the dominion and the gr greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints and of the most high, whose kingdom is what? It's an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey them. Well, that's a, that's, that's a great thing. The final scripture is going to be 1 Corinthians. Again, we're talking about the reward of the saints, topic number seven. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The incorruptible will put on incorruption. Christ does not plan to change the world single-handedly. At his coming, his servants will be changed. Well, prophecy fills in a lot of blanks. It doesn't give us 100% of the answer, but prophecy is an integral part of the Bible. And then God inspired these words for mankind. Through God, he, is, he reveals himself. Through, through these prophecies, he reveals himself. He reveals his mind. He reveals his attitude, his likes, his dislikes, and his plan for humanity and why they're here. Bible prophecy is built around a framework of specific principles and themes. I've touched on a few of those principles and themes today. Knowing them, being aware of them, is a key to understanding and unlocking Bible prophecy. So let me just repeat these points real quick. So number one, the first important key is an understanding of biblical prophecy is to recognize that almost all prophecy directly relates to the intervention in human affairs by one key player, Jesus Christ. Point number two, another purpose of prophecy is to urge repentance and offer everyone forgiveness through Jesus suffering a death. Again, Masonic. Number three, Bible prophecy analyzes the past and provides a vision for the future. And it's always kind of nice to, to, to test history to get some other sources and 
look into maps and stuff and and figure out the towns and cities that are in the bible that's kind of fun for some folks uh number four this is obvious there is cause and effect in bible prophecy you do this and here's your blessing you do that and here's your curse cause and effect number five prophecy provides far more than a simple list of predictions again this gets into the mind of god uh, giving us his viewpoint on righteousness, holiness, overcoming. Uh, number six, what is a prophet and what is he sent to do? Uh, these are people, men who came and gave instruction and lessons, reminded people of their covenant with God, and they showed kings and nations the sins and proclaimed God's call to repentance. And number seven, rewarding the saints and rewarding the just jesus christ has promised to report people who through the ages have faithfully served him i call this message memory lane because a lot of these things are just reminders for uh, people that have been in the church for a while some of them maybe it's brand new if you're just starting to to listen to this what I will tell you, there's a really good book available online. It's called Understanding Biblical Prophecy. It's about 57 pages. It starts with some of these issues that I discuss here and goes into more of the specifics that I did not discuss. So I recommend the book and we'll be ready for questions during message chat. So nice being with you all today on this Sabbath. <laughs>